Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Mary Ellen Poole, who serves as Carnegie Mellon University's Dean of the College of Fine Arts. Mary Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. I'm thrilled to be in Detroit. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, as we like to say, broadcasting from. Uh, and so, uh, and you know, there's so many exciting things going on at, at, at Carnegie Mellon, an amazing institution. One of our great uh, creative partners here at Arts Engines who helped us co uh, curate this particular show. And I thought we would just dive right in across, you know, music schools, conservatories across the country faculty is always, you know, a type of issue in terms of how do we build representation on our faculties. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people look at this and, they, you know, we have what are viewed by many as kind of traditional power structures. And when people are in institutions, they often look and say, how can I make change? How can I really have a voice? Those types of things. So curious, kind of, how do you view that from your leadership perspective? Um, and what are you doing uh, at CMU? Well, I, if you don't mind, before I talk about CMU, I need to give a shout out to my previous institution, the University of Texas at Austin, where I was seven years as director of the Butler School of Music. And I think as an example of the way an institution can really transform itself by transforming its people, that's, that's my best example right now. Because I will say I've been at CMU for um, four months now. <laughs> so obviously all the, good, all the good stuff is ahead. But at Texas, we recognized that it was structural, that it was in the way we set up our search committees, in the way we wrote our ads to some extent, but most of all in the way we sort of passively sat there and let candidates come to us because we're Texas, right? So that wasn't working out very well for us. And I think we were something like 77% male and 88% white at that point when I got there. But couple of things we started to do with faculty. And one is um, the infamous 555 rule. And I say infamous because the faculty at first were like, oh my gosh, do we have to do this? But I ask for a list before the search even gets started of five people from three underrepresented groups each. So in the case of Texas, it was always five Black candidates, five Latinx candidates, and five women because we were 77% male. And so getting those names down on paper, making contact with those folks, even if they're aspirational, and somebody calls you, you're not going to join our faculty, but you might know somebody who would be a good fit for that. So just doing that outreach at the very beginning before the search even started was pretty transformational. And I think also normalizing our intent to make our faculty more representative, um, talking about it as though, of course it's going to happen because you know music faculties, you know, sometimes they get a little bit petrified of change. And so just, talking about it over and over and over again. I am so proud of the results that we got just in the last couple of years before I left. And I hated to leave those faculty members. Totally. And, you know, so, and you raise such a, a great issue, I think, because a lot of times people look and, and, and on the one hand, they're like, you know, how is this? We just, we don't have, you know, a representative faculty, et cetera. And what's amazing is that a lot of times people then just, well, 
we put out our ads, we did our normal search and we well, don't realize a cigarette. <laughs> that. And when you do things in the way that you've done them and even just these key things can make huge monumental differences because it gets outside of that typical course. And, and I know, and so often a lot of faculty talk about, they're like, well, here's who I know or whatever. But when you mm -hmm. kind of initially do that, you bring new voices in. Now, all of a sudden, you just broaden the, the scope. So I think that's that's wonderful. And I think something, too, that if practiced at every you know music institution uh, across the country, within five to 10 years, we would transform the representation, I think, on faculty. Yeah. Um, so it would really be, really be amazing. So to kind of continue with these really tough questions, and hopefully by the time our time's done here, you will have solved all of the key issues. Uh, in in higher education um, and, and all of the arts, but um, is as we think about the canon, right? And we think about our curriculum. A lot of times this can often be viewed as difficult to change and all of that. And so especially for those in our audience who are in leadership positions um, and or who are faculty who feel like I, I wish we could, but we just don't seem to be able to. What methods do you have you found either work or that you would encourage people to consider? So uh, in some ways, I think this is the hardest nut to crack because there is a huge psychological resistance to going outside our comfort zone. And if you look at the faculty on our campuses now, you can infer the way they were trained, where they were trained, you can pretty much tell by looking at somebody, oh, they went to Juilliard. So you know something about them already, it's code, right? And they are very comfortable um, reveling in their own expertise. They are experts to their students, whether they're a studio teacher or a classroom teacher. And that is hard won. You know, I think sometimes academics spend their whole lives getting more and more and more focused. And so to have to go outside of that and either evaluate somebody on an audition who's singing a piece you don't know and is not from your repertory and you never heard of, or trying to teach them that piece, or trying to learn a whole new methodological approach to teaching musicology in a way that your teachers never taught you, it is this whole, excuse the expression, master apprentice uh, model that we have used in music education for so long, it does not lend itself to transformation. Mm -hmm. And so I think one thing that helps a little bit is identifying that problem. And while not saying it's okay, to be this way, just acknowledging that people do feel, frankly, insecurity and fear around going outside that comfort zone. And then the other solution, I'm going back to my other answer, hire different faculty. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting when I was at the University of Michigan as a student some years ago um, mm -hmm. and discovered uh, and my private teacher exposed me to music by black composers, which prior to that, I didn't even know existed. Um, but then just that act of being able to do that and perform mostly that music on my recital, I had to go through special processes because the, I was not doing the standard rep that was expected for a degree recital and all of that. And it really been beginning to, to see that change. And so are there any key things to kind of follow through on that in addition to, of course, hiring new faculty and hiring faculty um, who will have some uh, knowledge of more broad uh, repertoire, et cetera. Um, any other kind of key things that you think that um, music schools, art schools can do in terms of you know, evolving our curriculum to be more inclusive? Well, I think that one, we have to start structurally. And you just mentioned a repertory list. And I can, I can still see in my mind's eye that catalog with the list for violinists and the list for flutists. And, you know, woe unto you if you stepped outside that. 
what if we stopped thinking about it that way? What if we started thinking about outcomes instead? And I don't mean to sound like an assessment head, but what if you started thinking about um, a lyrical piece and a piece with this particular technical thing on it and opened it up outside of the, the, the guys that we usually um, turn to in our comfort zone. But I think also if most music schools have a kind of division between the academic faculty and the applied faculty, and I actually think the pioneers in this area are the scholars, the theorists, well, some theorists, I should say, and the musicologists, the ethnomusicologists, I wish they had more say over the, and this is, you're going to get calls about this, but I wish they had more I'm say. I'm getting calls. <laughs> and more influence over the approach to canon and the approach to curriculum in their schools. They, they're seen as you're in charge of your class, you know, stay in your lane. But in a healthy music school, I would hope you could have conversations across those lines. Totally. And, you know, and I think that's so key. And I've seen this, you know, both in the private sector with, you know, uh, nonprofit organizations, orchestras, et cetera, where when they, for example, empower people who work in development to have a voice and to have contributions they can make in programming or programming to be able to make contributions in development, these kind of cross you know, very much disciplinary in those settings, but then in an academic environment, exactly, to be able to have an influence, to be able to share your voice outside of your specific courses um, mm -hmm. or even your specific department is completely empowering when you see that. And especially with so many students who want not only broader mm -hmm. repertoire and canon and curriculum, but also so much more interdisciplinary desire, I think, on the part of students these days. Um, so yeah, that's that's great to great to hear for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're getting just a little short on time, but I, before I get to kind of my last question, I wanted to kind of you mentioned or kind of talked a little about this idea of student leadership, students leading us, and you know, there's definitely I know people in our field who are like, you know, what students need to do, what we tell them to do, we know what we are the ones who are trained, etc. Um, and then, of course, others who are like, you know, student empowerment and let students help, uh, you know, to be able to architect a lot of the, the things that we do. How do you view that? And, and what do you think are some of the ideal things we can do? I think that students, well, obviously music is one of the, and I'm, I'm dealing with five different art forms now. I've got five unruly children instead of just one at CMU. But music is one of the most, um, it's that apprentice relationship again. It's super hierarchical. You're supposed to do as I say. And um, while I think that's changing somewhat with some new blood in the, the teaching studio, it is, it is a hard habit for us to break. But one thing that we found really powerful at Texas were a set of innovation grants that we gave out. And it was the weirdest thing, Aaron. We didn't say this has to do with social justice or it needs to be an impact grant or something like that. But we found that our students were not asking for money to go to Aspen. And they weren't asking for a new vocal for their bassoons. They wanted to do things that would make a difference in the community and that would bring new repertories. And so what we started to do was boost the heck out of that, to put it in front of the faculty, put it in front of the advisory council, put it in front of the other people in the College of Fine Arts, because these students who were, they weren't great at writing grants, so they had to learn how to do that. They had to figure out how to execute a grant, which may be harder than and writing it, but there, the subject matter that they naturally gravitated to was so inspiring to the old folks that they couldn't help but start to think, how can I incorporate some of this into the way I teach, into the kind of assignments I make? And so 
I'm, I'm all about seed money. Yes, uh, it's so critically important uh, if we're really going to empower students. So unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask, I guess, you know, when, when these, this work, and especially in these leadership roles like yours, there can be tough days. Uh, and on those tough days, in those kind of toughest of times, how do you draw on inspiration, on strength to be able to find a way through? Mm -hmm. Well, I think... One of the other questions that we talked about earlier was how, you know, what advice do you give to people who want to do this work? And one of the most important ones for me is finding your people. And for me, this is a group of friends, maybe a couple of family members thrown in, um, who I know I can absolutely confidently count on for a smart wide ranging, empathetic conversation that is gonna refresh me when I go back to my tough day. And so here I am with you. Wow. <laughs> well, Mary Ellen Poole, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me and right back at you, Aaron Dworkin. <laughs> Thank you.